and overnight from four straight years of all, being an all-star, two-time all-NBA, the addiction to alcohol literally spiraled me out of being one of the top players in the NBA within 24 months. Welcome to another show of Analysis uh, Podcast. Today we have a special guest, and you know we gotta we gotta do the intro. Number forty-two <laughs> from Lake Wales, Florida. <laughs> Then America's best kept secret: <laughs> the chicken <and> bake <laughs> baker. <laughs> Thank you, Nasi. Thank you. That's the best, man. I haven't gotten shake and bake before. That's I appreciate that one. Oh my God! Hey, thank you so much for being on the show. For sure, man. Uh, just another another inspiring moment to inspire our, our viewers and listeners, man. Awesome. No, thanks for having me, Nasi. I'm I'm happy to be here, man. Uh, okay. So, you know, you have first of all, you have fans all over the world, you know, and I know most of the uh, people maybe in the U.S. know a little bit. Mm -hmm. Of your story, but they are like I kind of know mm -hmm. two more percent of it. So let's say I would love, really love for you to yeah. kind of walk us first through, you know, your basketball journey. Mm -hmm. But you know, I know because you started in Connecticut, mm -hmm. went in high school, old Saybrook, yeah, and then how, and then what happens? Yeah. So my journey like started in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, small town in Connecticut, and. Um, You know, I'm the son of a, a pastor, so I'm a PK. Uh, my mother, first lady, hardworking. Both my parents, super hardworking okay. when I was growing up. Um, Old Saybrook, my my hometown, not exactly a hotbed for basketball, but, um, you know, I grew up with a passion for basketball, passion really for sports. And, you know, I tried my hand at football. Football is actually the first sport that I really tried. Um, but my body wouldn't just, wouldn't allow it. So, um, but I grew up, you know, loving basketball, watching it just like any other young kid. Um, not as much access to, you know, all the teams like you have now. So I grew up a Philadelphia 76er fan, believe it or not, a big, big Dr. J fan. That was my favorite player and favorite team. But like anybody who grew up in the 80s, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, all yeah. those great players also were um, players that I try to be like. So, you know, my journey started um, as an eight-year-old kid, nine-year-old kid, just trying, just loving the game, not really competing until I was 15, 16 years old, um, just really just going out in the backyard shooting. And then um, when I got to high school, believe it or not, my freshman year in high school, I was cut from the team. And then my sophomore year in high school, I only played JV. Um, and then I had this massive, I was about 6'3 when I was a sophomore, 14, 15 years old. And then I had this massive growth spurt, like between the ages of 15 and 16, I went from 6'3 to like 6'7. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so I had the passion to play basketball at 13 and 14, I just didn't have the game for it or the height. So that, that came along. You know, you know, that's so interesting. Um, a lot of guys who are in the NBA, it's really rare to see guys who, you know, being the top of, uh, I don't know, let's say, want to say LeBron maybe, mm -hmm. just being the star of the whole. Right. Right. Through, uh, everybody's been like, you know, through high school, been either cut from teams or mm -hmm. either played JV, mm -hmm. which is uh, JV for people who don't know overseas is like more basically the second team or the right, yeah, the younger team. Let's yeah. say example. Yeah. But uh, and then all of a sudden, one summer, just boom. yeah, one summer, my height, um, six three to six seven. Um, I played varsity my junior year, my senior year, and I was six seven. I wasn't highly recruited okay. out of high school. Um, just a couple of schools really recruited me, University of Hartford being one. And, uh, you know, they offered me a scholarship and I took the uh, the scholarship because it was one of one. <laughs> um, and then uh, what's awesome is I grew from my senior year, this growth spurt didn't stop when I was in high school. From my senior year in high school, I was 17 years old, to my freshman year 
at the University of Hartford, which was just three months, I grew three more inches. So I was six seven when I left high school. I was six ten and a half when I got on campus. So I had this crazy, crazy growth. So, so they recruited you as a six seven. Yes. And they ended up being a six uh, ten ish. Uh. Yes, it was crazy. Like it was. And and what's awesome about the the growth spurt for me, also in hindsight, obviously, was I was I thought I was going to be a guard my entire life, so I trained and played like a guard, like always trying to handle, always trying to handle, and then and then when I got that growth spurt between my senior year and my freshman year, when I got on campus, my coach Jack Phelan was like, "You're going to get your big behind down there in the post, and we're going we're going to make you a, a power forward," but. <laughs> Kind of, I think this is similar to like Anthony Davis's story. Like he was a guard his entire uh, career growing up, and then turned yes. into a to yes, a power yes, forward. Yes, 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 yes. The same thing with um, mm -hmm. AD, you, Jan. The same yeah. Jan. Jan uh, Giannis was our point guard. It wow. was our point, and and he was like six three ish, six four ish, been our point guard for like two, three years straight, and then all of a sudden it became six seven. Still our point guard. He's then. still a point guard. Still a point guard. <laughs> yeah. Then boom. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Uh, yeah. I don't want to say he's high because you know people kind of think he's uh, shorter when they when they see him. But then, <laughs> yeah. you know, but then you go to Hartford, which you ended up, you know, going crazy. Mm -hmm. You still have the record there, two thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not wrong, two thousand two hundred thirty-eight points. Yeah, man. So how was your experience? How was your experience there? It was a great experience, man. Like you know, my growth as a player, you know. On the court, I, my first year, I took a beating. Like physically, college basketball, yes. even Division One, was just a a transition for me because I was six ten, but I was skinny, like super super small. And um, you know, there was a lot of big dudes at on campus, like six eleven, six ten, big guys. And um, you know, they were physical with me. Like I had yes. to learn the physicality of the game, and it took me a while. So my freshman year at the University of Hartford. I averaged four points a game. I'd like to say four more points than a dead man. So <laughs> I averaged four points a game. But then I, you know, I, I my passion for the game and competitiveness, man, mm -hmm. like in hindsight, I just wasn't gonna be denied. I wasn't like the physicality, the toughness of the practices, how good anybody was at that point really wasn't gonna stop me. So I just kept working, 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 working. And by the time I was a sophomore, I went from four points a game to 20 points a game my sophomore year. And then I went that's, to, that's one year then, basically. One year, yeah, one year. And Were you starting? Did you start? You, my freshman year, I didn't start. Yeah, and, now you and start, then my start. sophomore year, I did start. And uh, then I went from 20 points a game to 28 points a game my junior year. And then Man. I finished um, my senior year averaging like 27 points a game. And uh, I went from, you know, and it's, probably a six year span of not making my high school team to 1993, I was the eighth pick in the, in the draft, drafted by Milwaukee. So my my growth as a player, man, was coming rapid. My size was coming rapid, but yes. the passion for the game, the loving the game, the wanting to compete all the time, that's what I really, you know, credit my growth to. You know, I, I could, everybody in yeah. basketball eventually grows, gets bigger, yeah. gets stronger. But my I mean, passion. not everybody. You know, some people just. It all depends on how much work you put. You got to put some, put in some work. In. Yeah, for sure. It's not. It's for not gonna. Sure. I mean, naturally, for as sure. a man, you know, you become a little bit stronger. You yeah. Know, you age, but yeah, if you don't put in the work, in. yeah. So I was. I I I played anytime I got the chance outside mm -hmm. of uh, you know outside of uh, the University of Hartford. I, you know, played in summer leagues. I I played in the Junior Olympics. Yes. My sophomore, my freshman year going to my sophomore, I'm sorry, my sophomore year going to my junior year, I played in the junior world games, which was like the top 19 year olds, 20 year olds in the country. So the the, the I was starting to get national recognition recognition as well. Yeah. And, um, but more than the national recognition, I was starting to play with better talent. Like I was starting to get tougher competition. And um, every place I went to, at the University of Hartford, like in the summertime, I was answering the bell. Like, I just was like, wow. Like every time I came back to the University of Hartford, like I just played against cats from Michigan, Arizona, Duke, yes. and I was answering the bell. And so I didn't know I was gonna be 
how I was going to be as a pro, but I knew I was gauging myself against some top college competition. So you you get drafted. Mm -hmm. Eighth overall, Milwaukee. Shout out to Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, and then you come to the league. Yeah. How was your rookie year? So my rookie year was was great, man. Like, you know, I was so nervous about playing in the league and like any other young guy, but yes. I was excited. It was a nervousness, but it was excited. Uh, got picked, eighth pick. Didn't know I was going to be picked by the Bucks, by the way, at draft night, which made it even more excited. But where were you draft night? I was in Detroit at the, um, at the, uh, I think it was at Auburn, the Palace in Auburn Hills. Oh, so you were, you were at the so, draft? Yeah, I was okay. at the draft. I had an idea of where I would go. I just didn't know I was going to go specifically to Milwaukee. So Any other place you thought you was going to go? Um, I, d I didn't have an idea, to be honest with you, Nasi. Oh, I you were just there. I, Yeah, I, I literally, like, they didn't tell me that I was going to be picked at eight. But I had worked out for, like, from six to, like, 16. Okay. Um, so when, when the Milwaukee Bucks said my name at eighth, it made it that more exciting because it was like literally hitting the lottery. <laughs> so so my, my rookie season, man, was challenging the first year. The first few months was challenging. Again, the physicality, the speed yes. of the game was way different than I had seen at, at the University of Hartford. I mean, just different. And um, But I was prepared from a talent standpoint. I just had to adjust to the speed, the physicality. And um, so interestingly enough, my first three or four months of being here in Milwaukee, I came off the bench. I wasn't very happy with that okay. um, because, you know, I was in the draft pick, in the draft with Penny Hardaway, Chris Webber, mm. um, Jamal Mashburn, Isaiah Ryder, Bobby Hurley, Calvert Chaney. These dudes were like great college players and they came out of the gate, like getting to it. And, and that was your draft, Penny Hardaway. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, that was, it was a, you know, I also had in that draft Sam Cassell, Nick Van Exel, you know, Allen Houston. There were a lot of Allen great, Houston, great, you know, I, I actually had a stand with Allen Houston in with the Knicks. Yeah, the Knicks, yeah, yeah. With the Knicks, man, great guy. He yeah. always, like, had my bag, you know, always, like, come to my workouts. And yeah, work out. I, great guy, one great of my guy. favorite people. My Olympic teammate in 2000, but one of my favorite people. Was he the GM? The yeah, he, so at the time, he was the assistant with the Knicks. Got it. One of the, one of the team with the Knicks. And then one of the assistants with the Knicks, and then he was the GM mm -hmm. with the G League team. Mm -hmm. And then he it was the first year they had the G League team because I was the first draft that was going to the G League team. Yeah. So they, they made one, and then when I got there, he was man, incredible. Got it. Yeah, you know? no, Allen was great, great guy to this day. And um, so my draft was loaded. And, you know, the first three or four months, I didn't play a ton. Again, I was my development was slow. Um, I wasn't very happy about not playing a lot. And I never forget this, like the one thing that stuck out, sticks out in my rookie season, it was the inaugural year for the all rookie game. So uh -huh. like the top 16 rookies yes. were selected to play at the all-star game for the, for the rookie game. And me being the eighth pick, you would assume that I would be part of the 16 exactly. being selected, but I was not picked for that game. And the, the all-star game was in Minnesota my rookie year. And I remember going home and being so disappointed that I didn't get picked to play. So you, didn't, I, you didn't make the rising stars as they the say rising, now. Right. I didn't make the rising stars. Yeah, it's the mm. rising stars now. So I was like disappointed, angry. Um, but I was I was coming along. But just at that point in February, I, it wasn't it wasn't where I wanted to be or where the league thought I was was that I was one of the top guys. But from February to the end of the season, which was the regular season for us because we didn't make the playoffs, I went on a tear, like 20 and 10s, 20 and 10s. And then by the end of the season, I went from not making the Rising Stars game at All-Star Weekend to being a unanimous choice first team all-rookie. So my development was crazy, man. It was like every year I kept kept improving and it didn't stop in the pros. I went from four months of learning, figuring out the game to by the end of the season, I was one of the um, the top rookies. And then the following year, my second year, I went from not making the rising stars uh, my rookie year to being an actual all-star. 
With the All-Stars? With the actual All-Stars my second year. So man. I was tremendously blessed, man. God was, you know, I was developing into, you know, a, a really good player. And um, I was getting the accolades and people were starting to recognize my talent, um, which was awesome for me. All right. So you go, this is, this, okay, now we're talking about your second year, sophomore year. So you ended up staying with Milwaukee four years? Four years, yep. What were you doing these four years in Milwaukee? How, how So you go your rookie year, sophomore year, and then you got two more years. How do you, how do you eventually leave? Did you leave in free agency or? No, so um, I ended up being an all-star here for three years. Out three of years four, straight? Three years straight. So after my rookie season, of, um, like on your on your rookie contract, you're an all star. Three. Yeah, on my rookie's contract, I was an all star three times here in Milwaukee. Who 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 uh, who who else has ever done this though before? Maybe LeBron, LeBron, LeBron maybe. Yeah, maybe. But LeBron but, has been but, an all star. Yeah, I or think Shaq, so. Shaq yeah, but those dudes maybe? were like selected. Number one though, they they were selected by the fans. Ah, I was selected by the coaches which is a little bit different. Like, you know, I was mm. getting love from the coaches at the time. I wasn't- oh, so, like, all, so all of them wanted, wanted you to play for them, basically. Like as an all-star. All it, it feels different when you're selected by, yeah. as in a reserve. You yes. know, I'm in a small market um, and, um, you know, just playing well, man. And so the way I left Milwaukee was through a trade. Um, you know, I've been here three years and, you know, I had, my contract situation was a little funky because uh, the Bucks had offered me, they had just given Glenn Robinson six, $68 million over 10 years. 68 over 10. Yeah, which was a massive deal at the time. Yeah, a, a no, massive, it is. Hey, yeah, yeah. Trust me. It's, it's, it's 68, 68 million, million, 68 million is massive. <laughs> <laughs> right, so they had just given Glenn Robinson 68 million and they had, and I was a little frustrated with my contract situation and Love the city of Milwaukee, love playing here, but I was a little frustrated with the contract because, you know, my my counterpart, my best friend just got this massive deal. And then that's when they started handing out the hundreds. And the two people who had just come up on a hundred million dollars were Jawan Howard and Alonzo Mourning. Jawan Howard, yeah, was the draft class behind me and Alonzo was the draft class ahead of me. Alonzo Mourning, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Basically, great players, yeah. you Good know, player. Alonso was a Hall of Famer and Juwan yeah. was an all-star. So I was somewhere in between them as far as player um, caliber. Mm -hmm. And um, so the Bucks offered me like a nine year, uh, $60 million deal. Mm. And which is, you know, substantially less than what Juwan yes. and Alonso. So I turned it down during the summer, which led to, um, Later on in the summer, a deal being struck where I was traded to the Seattle Supersonics um, for Sean Kemp, and Sean Kemp went to Cleveland. So wait, wait, one, one second. Let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. All right. So you turned out a deal for sixty for sixty million. Sixty million. You said no, no. And then, then during the summer, they they're like, okay, but obviously it's business. You can't take it personal. You get traded. And you get traded for Sean Kemp. Who else? Just you, you and just well, the deal was you a and three team. Yeah, it was a three team deal. Uh, the Bucks, Seattle Supersonics, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Tyrone Hill and um, Terrell Brandon came to Milwaukee. Sean Kemp went to Cleveland, and then I went to Seattle. So it was a three team deal. So basically, Se so Seattle got you instead of Sean Kemp, basically. Mm -hmm. So you tra got traded one for one, basically. <laughs> yeah. For Sean Kemp. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That's 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 incredible. That's that's well they were No no that, that lets yeah. you know yeah where you was like your on your rookie contract deal, what kind of caliber player and talent was how you were seen in the league when you get traded for Sean Kemp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were two years they were two years Nazi removed from making the finals. Yeah. Of, or, or um, playing against the Bulls in the finals. So they had a, a great situation as far as, you know, with Kemp and Peyton, like a dynamic duo. Like yes. I, I, um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, man. Like I was a big fan of the Rain Man and the Glove, man. I'm like, this, <laughs> this, this is like Stockton, it's like Pip and Jordan, Stockton Malone, Kemp, Peyton. Yeah. 
So when I got traded to the Sonics, man, I'm like, wait a minute, man, no more Rain Man. <laughs> I, got, I don't dunk like that, man. I'm like, I like the, the so they're going to automatically get a shock to their system when they see how many finger rolls I do. When I get there. <laughs> so, no, but it was, it was, it was, um, okay. it was exciting, man. I was disappointed that I got traded, to be perfectly honest with you. Like anybody who's been in professional sports or know or been traded before, yeah, like no matter what the situation is, you feel like, man, they don't want me. You know what I mean? Although yes. I was going to a team that on paper at the time was a favorite or f to make the finals or just made the finals, I still was disappointed that I felt like out of myself, Ray Allen, because we also had, uh, we had Glenn, Ray, and myself. And out of the three of us, I'm like, well, I thought I was the one that they may keep, but they kept Ray and they kept, kept Glenn. But Getting traded to Seattle, man, was was a blessing. It worked out. You know, my first year in Seattle, we won 61 games. 61 games. 61 uh. games. Played for George Call, and it was amazing, man. Like it was, I never really won in my career like that before. So it was an awesome. Oh, so he was winning every out of the day. Yeah, yeah, it was like a two game losing streak, a three game losing streak. I've been on those multiple times, but when I got to Seattle, that was a thing. So it was a blessing to go there, get traded there. Gary, Gary Payton's one of my best friends um, to this day, so it was it was nice. Yeah, we oh man, he's he's Southern plays too, like Portland now. Shout out, boy, amazing player. Oh yeah, plays so hard. Yeah, like and and really, I love the way he plays and, and defense. So like, man, incredible. Yeah. But wait, okay, so you go there, and the uh, what did you sign? Did you end up signing with Seattle? So no, my first year in Seattle, I didn't sign. Uh, uh, my big contract until two years, my second year in Seattle. So my first year I was still on my rookie deal and I made the all-star team there as well in the West Western Conference. So now we're talking about four times in a row mm -hmm. being an all-star. Being yeah. as a rookie, four times in a row, like you just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, four times in a row. And um, I made second team all NBA that year. Um, and it was a great year. Um, but to be honest with you though, it, I didn't complete it the way I wanted it to complete. You know, we were the number two seed in the West. We ended up losing to the Los Angeles Lakers. Who, who did they have? They had, this is the, this is the year the Lakers had Shaq, Nick Van Exel, Eddie Jones, Robert Eddie Ory. Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones. Ooh, late, late. Yeah. Oh. The, a lot of yeah, those. I love yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones. Rick Fox, Eldon Campbell, but I left out one name on purpose. They had a young Kobe Bryant. Like my second, my first year with the, the Sonics, yes. uh, we lost to them in the second round of the playoffs. Kobe was probably their fourth or fifth best player, arguably. Really? So they but were he, loaded. But he was young though. He was, he was young. He was young. He was young. He was young Kobe. Is he uh, number eight? Number eight, uh, Kobe, yeah. yeah. Number eight, Kobe, but he's, I mean, you could obviously see the talent and how great he was gonna be, but that'll just tell you how stacked the Lakers were Ugh. at that time and how great, with the, like the, the pieces that they had. Um, they ultimately didn't represent the West. Utah beat them um, in the uh, Western Conference Finals. But but for me, that was the greatest year of basketball. Nasi, um, just everything happened to me that I wanted to happen. Um, I was selected to the Olympic team. I made second team all NBA. I had just gotten my Jordan shoe, my, my a signature Jordan shoe. So everything was from a basketball standpoint um, at the highest level anyone so could ask. Let me, let, so let, let me, let's go back a little bit. Let me get mm -hmm. this straight, man. On your rookie deal, your first four years, you become an all-star four years in a row. Mm -hmm. You make, you make, you, you make the you were second in the West. Mm -hmm. You get your own shoe, your own deal with Jordan. Mm -hmm. You make an Olympic team. Mm -hmm. This is like four years in the league. We're talking about like four years in a row, just coming up, just getting into the league. Yeah, it was a it was a it was a run. In hindsight, I didn't appreciate it enough. Um, I just thought. Do you, this do is you, what it do you, is. Do you understand? Like, if that would have happened today, <laughs> do you understand what that is equivalent to? A rookie coming in and four years straight in a row being yeah. an all-star? 
uh, after that being all star four years in a row, making an Olympic team as a rookie, then coming in having his own shoe. Mm -hmm. Crazy, then, it was like, crazy, yeah. No, it was bonkers. And what, what did you end up signing? What'd you sign? You said you turned out the sixty million. So I ended up, I ended up uh, signing in Seattle for six years, eighty three. So you you turned out sixty four ten, mm -hmm. ended up signing six years. eighty for six years. Yeah, six or seven years. It was eighty million. So, but after that first year, and I know you're gonna get to this. Nasi, but after that first year in Seattle, you know, a lot of the things off the court started to happen to me, like negative things. No, no, but that, that's 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 what I want to say. I'm, I'm like, I get I get goosebumps, but it's in, it's insane. Like you have you having a run, incredible, incredible run. What's going like? So that, I mean, if you look at it, if and I, I know, stay, and yeah. I, I'm sorry, no, and no, I know, good. like uh, the listeners and, and the audience, whoever is watching this kid. Kind of might not really understand what I'm saying. Like it's an incredible run. If that that's equivalent to of, like you become a Hall of Famer Hall off the of rib. Fame. Yeah, yeah. Off the rib, just coming into the yeah. league. This ain't no. Yeah. So I was on pace. Like if everything stays close to what it was, three or four or five more All Star appearances, a few more playoff runs. You know you. you Possibly talking about the Hall of Fame, depending on how everything goes. First ball, my second game, ball. Yeah. Right. My yes. game was aligned. My game and where I was was aligned to be just like anyone else who has been a four-time All-Star in five years. Um, but so that, what happened? So that that's where my success went straight to my head. Like the talent that I had, I was given so much so fast. And from where I came from, like I was hungry and no one believed in me. And I always had to like prove, 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 prove from Old Saybrook to University of Hartford, I had to prove. And I was determined to prove to people how great I was and yeah. how awesome I was. And, you know, I answered the bell every single time. What happened to me was the success and the accolades came what I wanted was recognition. I wanted people to know my name. I wanted people to say, he's just as good as Weber. He's just as good as Kemp. He's just as good as all the other power forwards. And they said it. And so I grew up very sheltered. I told you my pops was a pastor. So you know what they say about PKs, like we have with, at about, some point, yeah, PKs, pastors, preacher kids. Preacher kids. Some, gotcha. At some point, they're going to get a little out of their preacher shell, a preacher <laughs> kid shell. And so when I got the success and got all the accolades that, I mean, I might, my own signature Jordan shoe, I was at the top of the top. And so I started partying. Like, I started celebrating my success. Instead of saying, let's do it again. Hmm. Let's 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 come back and get stronger. We lose to the Lakers. We'll get them next year. I started to celebrate every accolade. You're talking about a kid who didn't make his high school team as a sophomore at 15 years old. At 22, 23 years old, just seven years, eight years later, I'm considered one of the top 20 players in the world. And so I didn't deal with the success well at all now see i started to i started to party smoking drinking now i have now i have a question because sure. like you know when you say party there there is there is like what is it with, so i get the the partying okay you can like i mean go out you know have fun go to dinner but you say party you like just every day so every day there was a point in my career that i was smoking we every day and then when i ultimately got to seattle the drinking was recreational it started off at recreational um but i've been exposed to addiction like i have family members who have lost their life to addiction and you know who struggle with addiction so i but i'm thinking 
I'm on the other end of the spectrum. Like I'm a star, like I'm a basketball star. Like this is what comes along with being successful is partying, women, drinking, smoking. And, and no, I mean, I understand what you mean but from the from the standpoint of the lifestyle, of course, but I'm saying like, it's not necessarily true because how it comes in is, you know, discipline and all the other things. 100%. Like there are, there are great athletes, professional athletes who have had great careers of being disciplined and winning championships, you know, Kobe, now we see Duncan, Giannis, great, great, great players who have been disciplined throughout their entire career. But for me, um, my celebration of individual accolades was bigger than team stuff because nobody around me had done what I had done. Not yes. any of my high school friends, not any of my elementary school. I didn't have anyone, not my college friends. So my, I was celebrated for my individual accomplishments and I knew it. I knew there's no one who had done what I had done. And so my celebration land, led to actual celebrating. And, but the, but the problem was that the celebration, the weekend warrior twice a week turned into every day. I want to party every day. I want to celebrate every day. And before I knew it, Nasi, in, in Seattle, my th second or third year, I became addicted to alcohol. Mm. It wasn't just a celebration anymore. It was actually needing to party or needing to drink, not even party, needing to drink all the time. Um, and overnight from four year, four straight years of all, being an all-star, two-time all-NBA, the addiction to alcohol literally spiraled me out of um, being one of the top players in the NBA within 24 months. I was battling addiction, battling alcoholism. So wait, so, okay, I get the, I get the definition of it. Obviously, I don't mm -hmm. know, you, you was, I'm assuming you were uh, drinking often and you were drinking, but was it every day? Every day. Every day, it was, it was. But did you, did you have practice, you had games, you had. So addiction, alcoholism. No, I. Yeah, so. I understand, but I'm just saying. Yeah, you, like the addiction to it. How did you play, how did you form? I managed, right? Like I managed to cover up, you know, the, the, I, I wouldn't say I managed to cover it up. I managed to function. I was a functioning alcoholic. So I could drink you know, prior to the games. Wait, to the actual game? Yeah, actual games. Do you understand how talented you have to be? To be or crazy. To... <laughs> talented and crazy. Yeah, it's talented and crazy, but I'm saying, do you understand how talented you have to be to be able to do both? Well, I, well here, here's the part of it that, the medical side of it, yeah. I see. So if you're an alcoholic, like I was an alcoholic, I needed the alcohol to function, period. Not just play, like the basketball part of it, like I had gotten to a point of drinking where if I didn't have a drink, my body would, I, I risked the chance of having a seizure. Like I was addicted to it, like literally addicted to it. So I'd have to like have a drink in the morning, a drink in the afternoon, so I wouldn't have the shakes. So it was, it became with, with alcoholism or any drug use, it becomes a part of not just your functioning, like, yes. you know, going out and doing things and party. It has, it's, it's a thing where you have to have it for, um, to be able to, you know, keep your heart rate at a certain level. Cause you do it all the time. And when you don't do it, your body's reacting like, what are we doing? Are we not drinking today? And mm -hmm. that's where I had gotten to in my career where my body actually needed the alcohol. Okay, so did you did you have maybe a friend or like family member say, what, what was the moment you understood like, man, this is a problem right now? 
So it took me a long time, Nasi, for the simple fact that when you make as much money as I had made and I become like one of the top players in the league, it's very difficult for people in your inner circle to say, hey, man, you need to stop or, hey, man, you're doing it too much or, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing this. I kept people around me that what? wouldn't say anything to me. Why, why is it difficult, do you think? Because they don't want to be out of the circle. Mm. You know, I, I still had a mm. I had a lot of money. I don't I don't need people like that in yeah, my yeah. life. I yeah, no, right mostly, I don't need yeah. Yeah, like I didn't I didn't have people that I had people. You know what I mean? That, I yeah. you got to For sure. And you know, I developed people and and in 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 fairness to a lot of my close people, a lot of people didn't know how bad it was, Nazi, because I was more doing it. I was a closet drinker, so it was behind closed doors. It wasn't just out in the clubs and partying. A lot of it was in my home. A lot of it was in, you know. Oh, so my, they didn't know. So a lot of, a lot of people know a lot didn't know did because I was, I thought I was doing a great job of masking it, but you can't mask drinking alcohol. Of course not. Before games and after games. It just, I, eventually it's going to um, reveal itself. And so, I got traded from Seattle to Boston. Even when I was going through this, I got traded from Seattle to Boston. And um, when I got to Boston, um, I was a full blown at the time, I was, I was still struggling with alcoholism. And I didn't even make it through the entire season there with Boston because, you know, again, I'm wearing the alcoholism now, like full blown, my, my game is being affected. Um, I'm not playing up to the all-star level I was playing at before. Um, and the Boston Celtics ultimately said, listen, you need to get some help. Like we're not, we're gonna support you okay. and get help. And at the time I just wasn't ready for it. And I see, I wasn't ready for, that's part of addiction and alcoholism. Like at the, that particular juncture in my life, I was not ready for them to say, you need to stop partying and drinking. I just wasn't ready for it. And so ultimately the $80 million deal that I had signed with the Seattle Supersonics, because of my drinking, the Boston Celtics terminated my contract. Okay. In other words, they took it back. It was over. So I had to, you know, three years into the deal, into the contract because of my drinking, 50 million of that came back. So you basically lost 50 million because of, not because of drinking, but it's because of the, the, the outside of things and the, and the addiction. Well, we set, well, not all 50. Ah, <laughs> that's no, a, we, we, we settled, um, we settled, you know, it went to arbitration with the NBA uh, and we settled for a number, but most importantly, man, like, I'll be honest with you, I know this went dark for a second, but I gotta tell you, when they terminated my contract, it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Like it gave me a chance, like I had been like hiding the secret. Gave you, gave you a reflection to see who what's going on. And, and, it, and it embarrassed me. What I was doing in the dark, this deep dark secret that I had of drinking was brought to the light. Like, mm. That was like, think about this, Nancy. I was this, this preacher's kid. I'm all NBA, all star. And this the perception of me was that I was a great guy, and I am, and I was. No, you are a great guy. I, but but I, but I had this 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 secret of drinking, right? And so when when it happened, when the Celtics terminated my contract, it was all over, everywhere. So, so it it, so it, you- it gave me. I had to deal with it. Yes. And I didn't necessarily deal with it at that moment, but I had to deal with it. My public perception was a lot, it meant a lot to me, right? So when that happened, man, it made me it made me say, I gotta deal with this issue, man. I gotta deal with, I really gotta stop thinking about being an all-star, stop thinking about proving to people. I gotta prove to myself that I can live a sober life, man. So, so what was your next step after that? What happened after the terminated contract? Man, it was crazy because the, initially, Nazi people don't 
won't believe this, but after the Celtics terminated my contract, I became like a free agent. Yeah. Like very sought after. Like teams wanted me to come and play for them. Cause it like most teams were like, did. all right, he drinks. Okay. <laughs> like <laughs> Like no one knew really. No, because they were trying to help you at the same right. time. Right, like, and okay. they were trying to. But, because you never had the. I don't never think you had the bad rap about about being a bad teammate or right. or being a uh, you know trouble on the court. Right, or this was like mostly a personal thing. Yeah, personal it, life. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was what I was doing to myself. I wasn't like a bad guy in yeah. the locker room or bad teammate. To your point, now see, I was just doing this this to myself. But it, what was interesting is when I was home. I felt horrible. Obviously, Celtics terminate contract with Vin Baker. It's all over the news. And I'm in New England. I live in Connecticut. So yeah. it's right down the street. So I started getting calls from teams. I thought I was done. And so I started getting calls from the My first three calls, Nasi, I kid you not, when I was terminated from the Celtics, came from Pat Riley, Isaiah Thomas, and Larry Brown. Damn, we talk about <laughs> legends right now, huh? Larry Brown yeah. was with the Larry Brown was with the eventual the, the world champion Detroit Pistons at the mm. time. Pat Riley was a president with the Miami Heat, and New York, uh, Isaiah was the president with the New York Knicks at the time. And so, I initially couldn't address what I needed to address, which was the 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 disease. Yeah. Because I was still being the basketball player, was still being sought after, yes. and so I fed that beast. So what did you? So what did you? So I ended up. Um, it's a crazy story, man. Like my Pat Riley flew me down to Miami twice. You know, I just got suspended for for alcoholism, Nasi. Miami South Beach ain't the place to be going by yourself. To, to go meet Pat <laughs> Riley, my brother. <laughs> so um, I flew. I flew to South Beach. I, I flew down to Miami. Man, I met with Pat Riley. Now, see, it was crazy. Like this dude. Shout out to Mr. Riley. He's great. He brought. He met me for lunch. He brought two books, a laminated poem with my name in it, and. It was crazy, man. I'm sitting across from Pat Riley after all this crazy stuff had just happened to me. Keep in mind, I just got suspended by internment, my contract terminated by the Boston Celtics. Now I'm sitting across from another legend who's like, I got you. And so um, I went back to my room. I was like, man, this is crazy. So I had an, a visit with New York. So I flew to New York. I met with Zeke. I met with Isaiah. So I've got both Isaiah Thomas and Pat Riley kind of bidding for, and, and the league was gonna, so what happened was when my contract was terminated, I, I was suspended, but the league was gonna reinstate me, like within like, if I passed a few tests, they were gonna reinstate me. That's mm -hmm. when I became the free agent. So I had the New York Knicks and the Miami Heat. And Miami, Miami keep in mind, hadn't become the Heat. Like they hadn't gotten Shaquille yet. So this mm -hmm. was like Brian Grant, D Wade, that crew. Um, so I'm down, I visited Miami a second time. I had visited New York and I visited Miami a second time. And so I'm in my, I, I messed around Nazi and, and, and I get, get to, they were gonna reinstate me like on the 12th. I'm in Miami on the 11th and the Heat are thinking that I'm gonna sign. I went out the night of the 11th. <laughs> so I go out, you know, I, I haven't dealt with the, the issue. Yes. I'm feeding the basketball beast and they're feeding me like, you're still great and we want you here. So I hadn't dealt with the issue yet. I'm in South Beach for a second time by myself. And so the next day I look at my phone, the, the, the league had reinstated me. So I get on the phone with my parents or with my agent at the time. I was like, bro, I think I should go to New York. <laughs> Like, I don't think I should be in South Beach. Like, by, you know, I was, I felt like New York is close to home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. My support system is there. Okay, the my country. dad's there, my mom's there. I was like, bro, I gotta. So the crazy thing is like that whole day I, I switched cause it was my second visit and Miami assumed that I was gonna sign um, with them. And I ended up 
like going to New York and signing with them and leaving Miami. I basically, this is the first time I'm saying this on camera, I basically snuck out of Miami, if that's even possible, because Pat was like, Mr. Riley was like, you ready to sign? And I was like, and, and I mean, obviously he would have said that. I mean, if you come in second time to- Right, yeah, no, for of course, sure. Of course. But I'm I'm still, but the, but the, in all, I shouldn't say in all fairness, at this, at, I wasn't thinking straight. Now, see, I still was drinking. Yeah. So I'm not think I'm not weighing these situations with a clear yes. mind. I'm thinking I'm making the right decision by going to New York and being closer to home. And and another reason I wanted to go to New York, interestingly enough, I just gotten terminated by Boston. And if you're gonna make a comeback. Oh yeah, you want to play against you want to play against your old team, yeah. And what better stage than the New York Knicks? At the time, they had Marbury, Allen Houston, Penny Hardaway, Kurt Thomas. They were in the mix. Um, and again, Miami wasn't Miami at the time. They were gonna become, you know, eventual champions with Shaquille and all that. But I was like, man, I want to go back to the Garden. And so I ended up going back, to, flying into New York, and I actually met them in Philadelphia. They, they picked me up in a plane and I, I flew to Philadelphia and met the team there at shoot around. I'll never forget it, man. I, I walked in shoot around and Marbury was like, the Olympians here. <laughs> my man, I was like, my man, I, I, he, the Olympian is not here. My brother's like, <laughs> like, I'm not the, the Olympian is not here. Vin's here and, and I'm gonna try to, we're gonna try to make do, but Marbury was like, the Olympian's here. He was just talking, like, it felt good, man, but. That's, that tells you, man, man. You, you, uh, you one of them ones, man. Yeah, so it, it felt good. And, and, and i tell you, a, a touching, a, a heart one a, touches me and it's like one of my great best NBA stories. Although I was in a tough spot, with the disease at the time, I still hadn't done what I needed to do to get sober. We played the New Jersey, at the time, the New Jersey Nets in the first round of the playoffs, Jason Kidd versus Marbury, a big deal for you know yeah. that time. And I didn't play the whole series, man. Like, you know, Lenny Wilkins was the head coach, didn't play the whole series, and it was fine. Like, I was just happy to be on a roster, man. Like, I made it back to the league out of all the stuff I had just been through. Finally, game four at the Garden, Lenny throws me in. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I don't know what the circumstances were, but I got in the game. And I think I had like nine points and four rebounds, like relevant points. We weren't yeah. getting blown out. It was like four, nine or 10 points and four rebounds. And I fouled out. And as I'm coming out of the game, as I'm coming out of the game, man, and, and um, the whole garden stands up, bro. Gives me a standing ovation. It was it was crazy. Like that whole year from being terminated by Boston, and it was like the the garden knew, but I wasn't thinking. I was just like, I don't foul out of the game. Yeah. I'm not even thinking straight. It was like a real, it was a surreal moment. And I never forget, I was crying by the time I got to the bench. And when I got to the bench, Tim Thomas, one of my teammates, he was like, hey man, you can't be out here crying and <laughs> don't let him see you like that. <laughs> Like it snapped me out of like, I was like, part of it was just the yeah, emotions you, you, of, yes, yeah, yeah, the of emotions course. of everything you, I had been through and getting this standing O, which I probably wasn't deserving of, man, because I was still going through it, but it it felt good, man. It, it was like, wow, people care. People it, care. Yeah. You, you know, I think we're in a society right now that because of, you know, all social media, of all these things you think like people don't really care. And you know how people are is like, and they try to motivate you more to be like, yeah, nobody cares. Uh, no, people actually care. 100%. And, some, and, some, and you know yeah. when people around you who care yeah. about you, you know? Yeah. Not necessarily that you got to do it for them. You got to do it for yourself. That's right. First of all, but, you know? That's right. But, uh, okay, okay. So you do all those things and then do you, do you uh, so how many years do you, stay? after New York, you go to another team or? So after New York, I ended up having a cup of coffee with a few teams. Um, that'll be pun intended in a minute when I get to the Starbucks okay. story. Um, but yeah, I, I ended up playing for like um, Houston. The Knicks traded me to Houston after Houston, cause I had like a two year 
eight, I signed a two year, $8 million deal with the Knicks, believe it or not. Um, and then I was traded to Houston. You, so, so I want to say something. Mm -hmm. And I want to do this and say it again and again. Do you understand how much talent you must have? <laughs> how good of a player you got to be to be just in and now, and all of a sudden you come back and you sign 10. Right. Now we're talking about like the numbers we're, we're saying about 10 million for two years or 8 million for two years. It's equivalent to like right. 16 now. Right. 15. Right. Yeah. It was no, a, I, yeah, I it was a, it was a mid level exception yeah. deal. It wasn't. You know, I had a deal on the table with the Cavaliers for four years, 16, and I took the two years, eight from, from New York. So I was still in the, you know, in the mix. But again, Nasi, in, in all honesty, in all seriousness, I hadn't addressed the issue, which was my disease. And so ultimately, to your question, Nasi, I ended up being traded to Houston. I finished the season with the Rockets, and then I called the Rockets on the second year of my deal, the $8 million deal, because I was scheduled to go back to them. Jeff Van Gundy was the coach at the time, and I called him, man. I was like, I'm tired, bro. Like, I can't, I need to take care of my life. Mm. Like, I'm not coming back. I was on the plane, I never forget this. I was like, when I get there, coach, can we sit down and talk? And Jeff and I have a great relationship to this day. Like, I, I love coach. And, you know, he's always, every time I see him, he tells me how proud he is of me. But I called him, I said, coach, I, I, need, I really need to take care of my life first. And I don't wanna come back and be on the team and be going through what I'm going through off the court. Um, and it might've saved you. Brother. And it did, 100%. It might've man. saved you, like, brother, And because... that was the start, like, that was the start of, that was the start of me turning the corner with my personal life, man. And not that I got off the plane and got sober immediately, but it was, I had to stop that train. I had yes. to stop feeding that beast, like basketball, basketball, I wanna get back. I wanna get back to what I was. And I had to make up in my mind, bro, you either wanna keep chasing your tail and lying to yourself about becoming who you once were, or do you wanna become the best person you can possibly be? Mm, that's what I wanna hear. That's, yeah. that's, what we, that's what I wanna hear. I wanna yeah. hear about you. So how, how, how did you like overcome all of this? How did you? So it was, a, it was multiple years after that, Nasi, that once I got out of the game of basketball, you know, I went through that whole maybe year or two, even more of just being saddened by my career and how it mm. ended. And then I started to lose everything that I had. It's well documented. I started to lose my fortune, losing my house, lose, I lost my restaurant, everything so, was, wait, 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 wait. yeah. So you lost your house? How? I lost my house to foreclosure. Like my lifestyle, the drinking, you know, mathematically, Drinking and addiction doesn't line a, align with having a lot of money. So I was finding ways to mask my addiction by spending, by giving, spending, giving, spending. And ultimately, financially, I hit a rock bottom. So wait, so all these, so how much money did you make in your entire career? Then? Probably upwards to 90 million. Okay, so then you come back after a few years, you lose your house. Everything. What, restaurant, what, everything. So you, you owned a restaurant, you lost yeah. it to what? It wasn't profitable or it wasn't? Well, no, was I just lost, yeah, no, I lost everything because I was a poor businessman and I was an alcoholic. Like, you don't think about finances, money, who's spending, who's stealing, who you're giving it to. And so my fortune was gone. Like when I finally got to a place where I got sober, my fortune was gone. Like everything. But let me say this though. This this is it's it, and it, so and crazy that you, you that you say this is because I've like we've done business and you're good. You're yeah, no, no, I'm I'm much I'm sober now. Now I see, <laughs> but but like, so, but but I want to say this though. This is maybe the first time I've said this out loud. Like people always think about the the amount of money yeah. that you lose when you have addiction, alcoholism, drugs. 
it makes sense that you don't, you're not a great, like some people, I'm not saying every person who's an alcoholic or has a drug problem loses all their money, but it's not mystical that you're not a great finance person or you don't take care of yes. what you're supposed to take care of off the court yes. when you're struggling with addiction. Like my addiction aligned with my personal life, my choices and my decisions, bad decision, alcoholism, whatever. You don't make good, you don't buy a restaurant when you're an alcoholic. You just, you just don't do it. And so, but, but I don't want to get too far to, losing everything, hitting this rock bottom financially was the best thing that ever happened to me, Nasi. Because it gave me time, it pushed back every person, all the people, all the hanger-ons, all the, it just pushed back everyone. And it gave me time to turn my life around. It gave me time to get, so I had no pressures. You don't have no money, you don't have no pressures. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That's no, true. You know the whole that saying, more money, more problems? I had no money, so not a ton of problems, right? As far as, you know, people, wanting to, people you. wanting to be around me, people wanting to take, I had nothing to give. And, um, you know, so finally, like, after I went through that two or three years after I was done playing of still drinking and, and hitting this rock bottom, I just got tired, man. And... I literally, because of my spiritual back background and my father being a pastor, just one day, Nasi, I said, God, I really need you to help me. I really want to be sober. And I went to this place called Rushford Center in Connecticut. I went there for four days. Now, this is like my fourth attempt at sobriety. But my mind was made up, man. I had nothing else. Like, I want, but I wanted my sobriety. I'm like, bro, if you want to turn your life around, the first thing you got to do is take care of you. Like no yes. more like tricking people and fooling people and chasing this NBA dream. Like really, really stop the train and change that part. And so I went to this place called Rushford Center in Middletown, Connecticut, like 20 minutes from my hometown. And here I am 13 years later, 13 years in April of this year, I'll be... 13 years sober. 13 years sober? 13 years sober. Thank you, brother. Man. Thank you, brother. 13 years sober. I, it's, that's, ins <laughs> that's insane. Man. In the journey, honestly, Nasi, like, I wouldn't trade, like, when I wouldn't trade anything that's happened to me in. I wouldn't change anything because of all the amazing things that have happened on this journey to sobriety, I got a chance to write a book, God and Starbucks. God and Starbucks. So now let me ask you a question about sure. this. God and Starbucks. So you get sober and then you start working on Starbucks? So I, I got sober and <laughs> one of my good friends, Howard Schultz, former CEO of Starbucks, like he was the owner of the Seattle Supersonics. So yeah. I, I knew him from the Sonics and we we developed a friendship while I was there playing for him. And, and so I was about a year and a half into my sobriety and I called him because now I got to start networking and working again mm -hmm. to get back on my feet. I, my mind is clear. Um, so I called him and he picked up the phone. He was so excited. He's like, Vin. And I was like, you know, like, man, I, I'm kind of cutting through the conversation. I'm like, man, I need to work. I need, to, I, need to get back, I need to get back on. And if you try to get back on, if you got a billionaire call, like, you got to get straight it. to the point. Right. Straight to the point. So anyways, he, um, he met me a month later in New York. We sat down, me, his wife, Sherry, and Jordan Schultz, and we sat down. We had a great conversation. And what was interesting is when we were done with the conversation, I was – you know, I had given my life back to Christ and and I was doing the conversation. I was like, God, 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 God. And I was talking to Howard. And, 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 and so when I left the conversation, when I drove back home, he called me. He said, I got it. I know what we're going to do. And he was like, I want you to go to this church in Harlem. 
I was like, church in Harlem? I thought, I'm thinking like I'm about to take over like five Starbucks and we can start there and then I take over 10. He's like, no, I got a great friend in, in Harlem named D Dr. Calvin Butts, God rest his soul, Dr. Calvin Butts. And I want you to go to Harlem, I want you to meet him. And so I ended up going to Harlem, meeting with Dr. Calvin Butts at the historical Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City in Harlem. And I became the youth minister there, the youth pastor there. I was there for two years. I studied at Union Seminary for my master's in divinity. I studied there for two years. I stayed there for two years. And it was a huge change in my life. It was like the most, one of the most pivotal two years of my life because I was able to work with the church, mm -hmm. study the Bible, it was, it was pivotal. And then ultimately I ended up calling Howard, like the, the, the ministry is amazing, thank you. I need some coins. <laughs> I, I need to make some money, man. And so he called me or I got an email from a guy by the name of Dan Potaski from Starbucks. And he was like, what do you think about retail? I'm thinking like, yeah, I, you know, I run a few stores. I got to learn how to do it. And he's like, yeah, okay, let's let's set it up. Little did I know that I was about to be stepping into the tallest barista in the history of Starbucks. Oh, so when shoot. I when I went to it wasn't any ownership. I was actually going to be a barista at Starbucks. So that's how my Starbucks career started. It ended a year later, but that's how it started. But okay, now, now okay. Let me ask you: You look, you look like one of the guys who would really be nice, though. You look like you could be. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> like I, I have the kind of face too. Like if I was working Starbucks, I'd be. Oh, I thought you meant at making the coffee master. No, nah, I was. Nah, I just nah. why I laughed because <laughs> I was horrible at that. No, 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 no. Terrible. Making the coffee, but I'm just saying, like as a manager, saying hi, you know, taking care of people, like just seeing like what's going on, make sure everybody's good. Yeah, no, it was, it was. It was so good to be there, man. Like a lot of people, like so many articles came out, like NBA player made a hundred million dollars now working at Starbucks. Oh. But to be perfectly honest with you, Nasi, it was one of the best years of my life. Little do people know, man, I was like living a sober life. I didn't care what the job was. I was happy that I was sober. Yes. That I was waking up every morning not needing to use a vice, alcohol, or drugs, like it was a pivotal moment. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't have any like grand ideas. I did want to become like district manager, regional manager at some point, but I was actually doing the job. You know, no one, a lot of people don't know what a clopin is. I do. A clopin is you close the store and then you open it. So leaving at 1130 at night from Starbucks and being back the next morning at four to open the store. And why that was so pivotal to me because it was disciplining me, Nasi. Mm. I, was, I was learning to live life on life's terms. You know, going from now I'm all NBA to being a Starbucks manager, that takes a level of humility. Oh yeah, it's definitely a happy moment. It, and it's not about the job too, it could be anything, you know? Right. It's not just right. the job, but just the level that you understand that you're not invincible, you're not, you know, you're human, you know, right. like, and this is life, this is, right. you know, life, it's like a, life is like a, like a stock, you know, it just goes up and down, up and down and down, but you eventually want to be up here. Yeah, no, for sure. Like the journey at, at 51, I see like, you know, um, going through my year at Starbucks. How did you end up leaving Starbucks, by the way? I got a job with the Bucks. <laughs> hey. I was like, I, it, it was either between Starbucks or the Bucks. And so, no, in all seriousness, I got a, I got an opportunity. I was working. The league had a, an assistant coaching program like six years ago. And I got an email from the league asking me if I want to be a part of the assistant coaching program. And I was like, absolutely. So I went to, um, I went to Dallas. I was, their G League team, the Texas Legends, was where I was going to do my intern. So I left the Starbucks job 
Um, and I started doing the assistant coaching program. In the meantime, I, I'm, I am skipping one thing. The Bucks were also allowing me to work during the summer, work summer league. So I was working with this. I was working with Starbucks, and I was working with the Bucks at the time. I was doing appearances with the Bucks, and then ultimately I was doing some summer league um, coaching. Okay. And then finally, Peter Fagan um, gave me the opportunity to. Um, do pre and post game with with the team. And so that was my first in with the Bucks. My first kind of full-time job was doing pre and post game with um, Fox. And so I was excited. Also on my contract, I got a chance to kind of be in the gym every day. True. Um, because Jason Kidd was the head coach at the time and that was my Olympic teammate. And so we were not only, we were friends and so you know, I was doing pre and post game, but at the same time I was, you know, working in the gym, just kind of being around, not really saying much, but kind of learning the craft of coaching. You know, I got a chance to be around Giannis more, got a chance to be around Chris at the time. Um, I think Chris, Giannis, my first year back, I think they may be the only two players from my first year being back with the Bucks, but I, I yes. got a great opportunity, man, to be around the organization sober. It was just a blessing, man. It is a blessing. We go off to two years, you know, doing all of these things. We go off to two years and we win a championship together, man. Man, like for me, Nasi, from everything I've you, said. You really went, like, yeah. it's insane. Mm -hmm. You went from being one of the top, most promising players and top players in the league and having a career take such a turn, you know, and then and then using the route of your networking and through people you knew and people, people who supported you in your lowest moments to coming back and winning a cha NBA championship mm -hmm. and then becoming one of the best coaches in the, in the, in the NBA. Thank you, Nasi. That's, that's, Thank you. That's, Thank you. Yeah, that's a movie right there. That's, yeah, that's, no, that's, I, a, that's a movie right Thank there. you. Thank you, Nasi. And I, I'm, I'm just... Every day I feel like I'm living a miracle. So I'm so blessed um, that God has given me a second chance. Um, but I think even more crowning. You want coffee for your second chance. You deserve yeah. it. You deserve it. And I think what I'm, I'm most proud of is obviously having this job and being able to mentor and coach you and Yanni and Brooke and Bobby and all, all of our guys. I think the most amazing thing about this second chance that I got is that I'm opening up IOP centers recovery centers yes. for people to get sober. Like that to me, like coming back to the NBA is awesome and winning a championship is even way more awesome and working with you guys is even more crazier. And then getting a chance to something that devastated my life, having a chance now to go out and help people who are going through what I went through is just over the top, almost unbelievable. Uh, to your oh point. Oh my God. Oh my oh I get I get goosebumps. It's 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 incredible, man. Mm -hmm. Like God gave you this chance and said, you know, he didn't he didn't do this to you. He did this for you. Yes. He did this for you. For you to be able to well said, be Nancy. successful again yeah. and build the centers. Well said, Nancy. And build the centers to help people. That's yeah. It. It's, yeah. It's incredible, man. Yeah. Ooh. Um okay, so now Kind of want to get into the kind of a I have a section yeah. show that it's called yeah. Amazing Facts. Okay, and, not, and now you got to tell me we're gonna do, kind of do it differently with you. Okay, we're gonna, you're gonna tell me true or false. Okay, okay. So true, true or false is the only one person in the world that's ever recorded a perfect March Madness bracket. Is that true or false? I'm gonna say that's false. It is false. No, no, never. Nobody. No one. Nobody is. No ever. one's ever. Wow. Ever recorded like yeah, the perfect like, yeah, yeah, the perfect March yeah. Madness bracket. Isn't yeah. that crazy? That is crazy. And they say like they they think that it has never been done, and they think that no one no one ever yeah. will be. That's crazy. Because you can't not every round every team. <laughs> There's gonna be upsets. You just don't know what upset there will be. That's what makes it hard to get the. And then they have all these, uh, what's the name of it? Cinderella stories that, you know, Sweet 16 teams go from like, 
you yes. don't expect them to go all the way to the, to yes. the finals. And especially now, like with team players leaving so early and choosing, there's no way that's gonna ever happen. If it hasn't happened already, it will never happen. It has not, happened. Yeah. I mean, officially, I don't yeah. know, maybe. No, no. No. Okay, another one. Um, true or false, elephants can jump higher than any other animal. That's a false. Exactly. I was like, <laughs> like wait, I'm like, wait. They, and the, the, actually answer, the, the actual answer is like, they can't jump at, at all. all. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Okay, okay, okay. I got you. And 13 years ago, Nasi, you might have given me the answer that differently. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, got you. <laughs> so, okay, another one. So, true or false, butterflies can taste with their feet. Butterflies can taste with their feet? Yes. That's false. That's, that's, actually, that's actually true. No way. I'm telling you, that's where their sensors are. Yes. What? Yes. For you guys at home? You guys listening? Yeah, Butterflies can taste with their feet. First of all, I, let me let's just stop the question <laughs> for one second. I didn't even know butterflies had feet. <laughs> so that that of threw me off like all that threw me off two, all together. Yeah. To, okay, they can taste with their feet. All so right. it's true. Okay, right. so let's move on to the next one. So let's move on to the next uh, section of it. So now this one is called the this or that. So basically, you got to pick one. All right, pancakes or waffles. Pancakes. Why? I'm not a big fan of how waffles, they're like a, I'm not a big fan of the, the texture of waffles. Like, I, the texture? Yeah, like, like how they feel? Much, how to... Yeah, how they feel. Like, I don't know. Nah. <laughs> they feel a little too crunchy for me. Like, I like my pancakes. You could do so much more with them. Okay. Okay. You're a waffle guy? No, no, no. I, I, Kind of both, but if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick, pick waffles just because of the ice cream. Most of I've associated waffles with ice cream. So right. maybe I would pick waffles. I right. Think. Yeah, I'm a big. Just, I'm, just because. Yeah, I'm not, I've never been like a waffle guy. I'm definitely a, a pancake guy okay. for sure. Okay, the next one is uh, coffee or tea? Tea. I've, I mean, <laughs> I worked at Starbucks for a year. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I've had too much coffee, bro. You know how much espresso that you have to drink in the morning to get that store going? <laughs> I never, ever, ever want to see another cup of coffee in my life. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a tea drinker now, but yeah, it's me too. I, I, I don't. I've never like I don't drink coffee. I don't drink yeah. coffee, so I'm a tea guy. Okay, comedy or drama? Oh, that's a good one. I see. If I had like, that's a good one. I'm gonna go with comedy. I'll go I mean, with comedy. Yeah. Why? I watch Martin like every single day. It kind of like yeah. it kind of eases my spirit, you know, like because we're in a high intense, you know, practice games, wins, losses. We're putting in a pretty dramatic job, <laughs> like as far as <laughs> what we have to do every day and what we're trying to accomplish. So I like to laugh. I'll, I'll take a comedy. I'll take a little bit of drama every now and then. Okay. But I'm if I had to do it, if I had to answer this mm -hmm. consistently, I'll go with comedy. Okay. Yeah. Uh would you rather be too hot or too cold? Too hot. Too hot, huh? For sure. I don't like cold at all. Like, cause yeah, too but cold. But yet here we are in Milwaukee. No, I know, but you know what's so crazy about cold though? And I, I'll tell you this from playing here and now coaching here. Like, I feel like the cold affects people's attitude. You ever walk in the street with somebody cold and they just don't look at you and speak? Like, you never seen somebody <laughs> miserable too. Like, you walking down the street in Miami they, or somewhere mm -hmm. hot or LA, they still gonna speak. Like, when you cold, you just trying to get to your destination. So you I know, feel you like- put it, put it Yeah, you're like, yeah, it's too cold to say hello. So <laughs> I, I'm gonna go with too hot. Because the cold. Okay, I'll take I'll take that. That's that's valid. That's a valid answer. Okay, and now the way we end this is like, uh, I mean, obviously if you don't have one, but we ended this with a motivational quote from our guest. You know, it could be a quote, it could be a story, just to inspire people out there. I mean, you already said the story is already so so inspiring. So it could be like something that uh, keeps you going every day, something that you tell yourself every day, and you know. Um. I would say what I would 
say um, my favorite scripture is Romans 8 and 28. And I won't quote it verbatim, but the scripture basically says all things work for the good for those who love the Lord. Like Hmm. all things work for the good. That means good or bad, whatever you're going through, all of it's going to work for your good. Um, So Romans 8 and 28, all things work for the good and all things have worked for, in my humble opinion, all things that I've been through have worked for my good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, it's this is it's exactly what I what uh, people need to hear out there. You know, it's eventually gonna work out, guys. If you're going through something, you know, you listen to this podcast, you watch this podcast on video, you're going through something, just remember, it's okay, and it's eventually gonna get better. It'll eventually get better. For thank sure. you, thank you, thank you, coach. Thanks thank for you, having coach. me, Nasi. Always, thank man. Thanks thank for having me. Uh, if you wanna see the podcast, you wanna listen to the podcast. Uh, you can always go to either the Kubras TV if you want to watch it on YouTube. And if you want to see a little bit of clips, you can go on uh, Thanasis Ante uh, underscore Ante 43 on the socials. And thank you guys for your support. Let's keep it going.